Hello and welcome. This is Sunrise Daily. I'm Ayo Makile. Well, it's a beautiful Tuesday morning from here in Lagos, Nigeria. I'm Kayode Okikilu. Welcome. Uh, I, 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 I like the confidence, the pride of Lagos, Nigeria. Well, it's a commercial capital. <laughs> <you know. laughs> it reminds me of the comments of uh, that, that you and uh, Chamberlain chatted you know, last uh, Friday. Mm. It was very, very inspiring, and the, you could sense and feel the passion, you know, of um, the UNDSG. Yes, uh, and um, I think, I, I, let me just hope that it's the same passion with which the House of Representatives Joint Committee on Finance and Banking and uh, Currency is querying um, Nigerian banks on alleged complicity in uh, non-collection of taxes from companies in excess of $30 billion. That only reminds me of a song. <laughs> in um, annual federation tax revenue between 2005 and 2019, the chairman of the House Committee uh, on Finance, James Faleke, made this point when uh, they were investigating uh, alleged annual revenue leakages arising from payments on account of uh, foreign currency, uh, denominated contracts by companies, and uh, foreign exchange allocation to companies. Now, the, the interesting thing, you know, in all of the, you know, comment is what he talked about when he said, when the, the lawmakers are querying, why the skyrocketing amounts of foreign direct investments mm -hmm. and capital importation are not being reflected in the economic, economic progress of the country. And most certainly, uh, even I am concerned. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's a big one. I mean, you know they talk about <laughs> trying to get revenue and the look for, or I mean, looking around different places for revenue, it's mm -hmm. understandable. And, and I think it's a blessing in disguise because mm -hmm. it helps us open our eyes to areas we have maybe just overlooked or... I mean, there was that talk about Nigeria having so much money at some point and the problem was how to spend it. But now that we see dwindling revenues, Nigeria is looking everywhere to ensure mm. that we get that money for infrastructure, development and the rest. And why you, I mean, the, the, the talk about the volume of FDI not reflecting in our economy is, is a major one for me. Because, Absolutely. I mean, just um, last year in 2020, mm. you see that, the FDI Nigeria attracted, according to UN CITAD, is, was $2.6 billion. Now, that was a time when COVID-19 was ravaging the world. In fact, it was more than what South Africa got, according to the UN CITAD uh, report, which was $2.5 billion. So when you look at it in context, Nigeria actually did better than South Africa in that light. So I, I understand that the lawmakers are wondering why isn't that reflecting in the reality of our economy? We've said that time and again. For example, the recoveries made, people ask, we see billions of Naira being recovered from, you know, uh, corruption proceeds and the rest. Where is the money? So <laughs> I, I believe the lawmakers are asking also, $2.6 billion FDI in 2020 at a time when there was a cash crunch, where? is the money. And I mean, it's important to say that whatever corrupt practices go on, there will always be connivance with someone in-house. Now, mm. this is an investigation that needs mm. to, of course, run its course. And we need to follow through and ensure that this is not just talk. There's something that comes out of it. And if there's nothing out of it, then we need to really look at how those FDIs are not reflecting in our economic reality. Well, that's, uh, you know, um, on the one hand, on the other hand, are the tools that the National Assembly already has, which is the Auditor General's reports. I'm going to talk about it almost all the time. I'm sure, I'm sure you have one by your bedside. Because, <laughs> <laughs> see, it's very, very troubling. Mm. Look at it. The Auditor, the, if you look at the analysis, an analysis made by Serap of the Auditor General's report in 2017, the 2017 report, a list of 11 infractions. 16 revenue generating agencies did not remit, uh, 26 MDAs did not deduct and or remit, irregularities in payments made by MDAs, on and on and on, unauthorized deductions from the Federation account by revenue collecting agencies, non-remittance of funds to Federation account, all totaling, all 11 items in fractions, totaling 2 trillion Naira plus, 2017 alone. Now, 
Um, it, it was a 2015 document that the National Assembly was looking at when the Senate President said, if you don't do the needful, we'll call you out. Just imagine what we would discover if we look at all the reports from 2015 to 2018. So there's the public service issue, there's private sector issue as well. So, I mean, I think, like I said, it's a blessing in this guy. So let's find that money. Okay, so, but um, you may need to hear this yourself. The committee deemed it imperative to investigate uh, revenue leakages and loopholes in the system that have contributed to a loss of over $30 billion in Nana Federation tax revenue between 2004 and 2019. The committee has noted the following major infractions which have multiplied effects on our infractions. Liftings of some crude oil and gas by oil exploration companies that were not wholly or illegally allocated to the consignors in JV, PSC, and PSC exploration activities, inflow of foreign investments in the form of equity, foreign cash loans, equipment loans, whose utilizations are majorly subject to tax, end up in transactions, foreign transfer that were at variance with the purpose of such inflows. Overnight, a fictitious disappearance of naira process of foreign inflows from the bank accounts of Nigerian beneficiary and subsequent allocations of foreign exchange by CBN for capital repatriation, principal loan repayments, and interest payments. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Let's take a look at some of the dailies and how they reflect development. Well, look at Vanguard, for instance, to avert third COVID 19 wave. FG halts entry from South Africa. I mean, some other parts of the world, uh, uh, the Far East, you see, parts of those countries are also in lockdown as a result of this data the wave of the COVID and so. But yeah, South Africa equally um, experiencing some surge. And you remember, if you do recall that um, report that had uh, spoken time and again about Africa third wave and now this well i think about now there are uh, you know persuasions trying to encourage nigerians who um have gotten the first jab of the astrazeneca vaccine to go for the second one now and then i think at some point they're also encouraging those who haven't to go for it so um they think that could be one of the ways that we could achieve herd immunity uh wherein you could then um who knows who knows, have some effect on the spread, but you never can tell. But they've got a host of riders here. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the, the interesting thing also is that we, you know, a good number of us walk around with the impression that it's over. Um, <laughs> well, if it's a good number, that's where my head was, it's just spinning. Trying yeah. to say, oh, okay. Quite honestly. And but maybe, maybe you guys have gotten the jab. And some have gotten the second one. So maybe in most that of light. that, most of this, what you're talking about is in urban Nigeria. Rural Nigeria, I don't think so. So oh, okay. that conversation needs to, so we need to step it up one how or the other. Hmm. Okay. Well, <coughs> look at the riders now. Put Zambia, Rwanda, Namibia, Uganda on watch list. 1,400, yeah, uh, so they need to... Um, I mean, it's, it's the way the countries rhyme, I'm thinking. Did you use it? <laughs> Zambia, Uganda, Namibia. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. Just on a lighter note, Yeah, right? but even if you look at South Africa, Nigeria. <laughs> so all of them do the same Maybe way. We need to, we need to do a, a critique of all what about Liberia? African, African countries. I mean, take a look at the <laughs> continent itself. So starts with an A, ends with an A, Africa. <laughs> so, so you, so you give it. That's why he's in my world say, ah, so much here. <laughs> <It's fun. laughs> you know? And I look at 1,434 persons who came into country from Brazil, India, and Turkey in quarantine. Wow. Airlines to pay $3,500 penalty for each the 14 passenger to receive 3.92 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine asks TB Joshua's followers to follow his funeral virtually oh okay oh yeah i think they had some people who were supposed to come in 
uh, from different parts yeah. of the world. So now, this is the suggestion. Well, well that is the big one right here. And then speaking about revenue, uh, you know, that you spoke about in Shidi, where is the money? You know, they always say, follow the money. But now, Nigeria losing $30 billion annually from revenue leakages reps. Yeah. Coming at the back of the Senate President's comment that we're poor. The only option we we'll have is to borrow. But now, revenue leakages, weak institutions here, they say it's depleting, it's even hitting us harder. I'm going to repeat the same thing I said. The Auditor General's report? Absolutely. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I know that script. All right. Uh, nobody can stop Yoruba Nation rally in Lagos. Akinto ye, Sunday, Boho. Well, right beside that, Nigeria media should be self-regulated, not by governments, NPAN president. So that debate was still, who knows, rich for a while. Don't forget to take a look at what you see on the back page. Uh, 61 athletes to fly Team Nigeria fly in Tokyo 2020. Yeah. And what a match up with the Euros. That's uh, what you see. Well, I'd rather take it, Mr. and Mrs., but uh, we still have some way to, some ground to cover. So, um, come on, we're our protesting. advice um, you help yourself. DIY. Okay. We're protesting. Well, let's flip over to the front page of the that's, Nigerian that's a Tribune. That's leakage right there. And I nobody stopped that protest. <laughs> <laughs> well, for the Nigerian Tribune, the lead is politics. That's right. And this is a statement from the PDP. Our defecting governors lack courage. Okay, let's stick to writers. Threatens to challenge Zamfara governor in court. 18 APC governors set to receive Matawale. I think the date was meant to be yesterday. <laughs> National State Assembly members, PDP ex goes at all levels in the state to also defect to APC. You know what, I'm, I'm not going to comment on this. Let me just tell you that on the back page, you have learned expressions of Ebola de Borua SAN. And you know what it is titled? Nigeria and the unchanging face of politicians. Not the unchanging face of politics. Politician. Politicians. Mm. Wow. Okay. By extension. <laughs> So, uh, I'm not sure they're related. Maybe they are. I just, just caught my attention and I thought to point it out to you. So, that's the big one for the Nigerian Tribune uh, this morning. So, I mean, I'm, the defecting part caught my attention as well. So, I mean, is this a continuous thing we will see? Well, on top of the nameplate, you see COVID-19. FG bans travelers from South Africa to receive more vaccines from India. Page 3 of the paper this morning and of course you have that front page comment on the obnoxious media bills clearly that conversation is still on that's the night the, the, the nigeria press council act and the national broadcasting commission act it's it's going to be quite an interesting read uh for you and uh, uh, something regarding food which is important right hunger cbn releases fifty thousand metric tons of maize from reserves it's on page six and I, and I look forward to having some sustainability uh, to this yes we can keep well we can't keep doing the reserve thing i mean it's it's meant to just buffer for a period but what's the the, the, the mid-term and long-term plan i mean we don't want to deplete all our reserves right mm -hmm. so that's uh, well that's good news and you, how you might far it? reaching will that be in solving the hunger problem and mm -hmm. ameliorating the poverty problem how far will it hunger go hunger wars Big question there, Hungry big games. question there. Let me just take this one more. Army loses two soldiers, kills 12 terrorists in Borno states. It's on page four. That war is still ongoing, we shall see, and we're forever grateful to our troops. Absolutely. That's the Nigerian Tribune this morning. Well, um, it would seem like um, the Nigerian Tribune and the Daily Independent compared notes. So one is speaking this, the other is speaking that. Daily Independent leads with this one. Defections. APC, a highly unprincipled party. Sage. And guess what the writer says? Says PDP governors joining ruling party are opportunists. Is that the response to the Nigerian Tribune? Well, the details continue on the inside pages. Right under the picture, you see there, Nigeria loses $30 billion annually to revenue leakages. 
let me not sound like a broken record and just let that slip. Uh, so many other issues you'll find right there on the inside pages. Military, civil authorities battle over leadership of proposed agency. What's that all about? Details you'll find on page 7 of the Daily Independent this morning. Uh, take a look at the Guardian next. Travelers ditch summer travel over multiple tests, 100% hike in airfares, multiple PCR tests, quarantine, restrictions, frustrates holiday makers, the Guardian reports today. Foreign airlines jostle for Lagos, Abuja market without promotional tickets. Blame weak Naira, rate of exchange, high operating costs, says Bernard. Experts explore tourism destination within Nigeria, Africa. I mean, I was waiting for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> There are a lot of places you can travel to in Nigeria. Yes, there's still the challenge we're trying to, uh, you know, get sorted, which is insecurity. But there are places around you you can actually yeah. visit and ensure that you spend the Naira in Nigeria. Right? But what, yeah, what, the Guardian, what, this, what the Guardian is saying this morning is just mentioning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the only, th the only question that I'll be asking is, how do we sustain the momentum? Remember what uh, the Cross River State Governor started, uh, the former Cross River, uh, Donald Duke, started, you know, with the Tinapa and all of that, so many other things like that. How have we been able to sustain that? Or was it just something somebody did? Yes, has it been sustained at first? Then? That's the challenge. The, you know, the releasing, you remember the Obudukato Ranch, the Yankari Game Reserves and all those things. What's happened to them? Have we even prioritized? Do you know that the whole world believes that Africa is the next tourism destination? So Africa should start believing that. All right. Well, um, in addition to the belief, we need to activate plans, concrete plans, measures, and take steps to ensure that. Because those are the countries that your people go to. They have put certain things in place. Absolutely. So, and then you see stakeholders canvas railway reforms as Abuja Kaduna train suffers another breakdown. Passengers stranded for hours. You don't want to be a tourist stranded in this area. I mean, that's some type of tourism, you know. Let me just, let me just say this from another angle. You get to see the scenery at this pause while you and are, enjoy the moment. While you are locked down. Well, wait, look at this. <laughs> NRC apologizes to passengers, says incessant breakdown, normal. It's due to lack of maintenance, say stranded passengers. FG generates 918 million naira from rail in three months. You know, it's very important for us to not allow the rail system to go the way it went over the years. Mm -hmm. Well, even if it is normal in the practice, you know, the mind, the, the, what it tells our people is, when I don't start again. <laughs> Let me add this too. Maybe you. I know, who knows, we may be wrong if you say something after this. Senate indicts NSITF management over 84 billion naira misappropriated in four years. Should I say you it? Let's say it for him. No, this is general's report. Where to go? <laughs> All right. Let's well, take a look at that during News Direct. I mean, at least we have a consensus. Oh, yes. <laughs> for now. But you see, to repeat after him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what Nigerian News Direct leads with is uh, banks, others intensify borrowing from CBN amid liquidity challenges. So, I mean, wow. clearly, it's, it's not just the government that is battling these things. It, it trickles down. It's, it's, it's all around. States, um, too. Oh, yes. And you see, borrowing rose by 183%. So um, that one is on page two. Tries to put a lot of things in context. I mean, Nigeria needs to stay liquid, right? Money needs to flow as much as we say uh, there's inflation. In fact, that's why money needs to flow the more anyway, so people can afford things. So it's, it's a big one, really. And um, page just, two. I, I, just, I just ask, I'm just wondering if we are paying attention to why the money, the investments are not showing. You know, the conversation we had yesterday the experts are underscoring and under, underlining the importance of insecurity 
or the complicity of insecurity in all of this. It's not going to allow the investments, the all of the whatever good government is doing, if any, to show because so long as there is insecurity, according to the former president Jonathan, Nigerians are traumatized. So, I mean, that's Nigeria News Direct for you this morning, but let me just add this one. No fraudulent dealings in planned equity participation in Dangote Refinery. It's coming from the NNPC. There's been a lot of talk around that. Let's see if there for the paper. The leadership newspaper this morning says, UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed wants more women in leadership positions. That's how it leads this morning, and... The writers are calls for coordinated approach to humanitarian crisis in Northeast. Commence leadership for courageous journalism. You know, this is not just going to go away. Uh, all of those figures that we hear, all of those uh, interests, all of those permutations about the number of women that should be included, the percentage of women that should be included, um, how we even putting them into action, how we put in action into works. How we put an affirmative action into action. Affirmative action into action. Mm. But because without that, man, what are we talking about? In action. In action. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Certainly in action. And that's talking about women. How about the youths? Mm. What's what's the structure was how we bringing them in because unless we do it I mean I remember one thing that you know the women a woman also said the, the UN Deputy Secretary General also said about the importance of bringing youths in failing which we are at a risk as the lead of the leadership newspaper FG begins revenue beg your pardon FG reviews begins review of revenue allocation formula this is also coming, uh, you know, uh, behind that judgment, you know, secured by, uh, I think, uh, Ubani and a number of others about whose job it is to assign the salaries of members of the National Assembly. Let's see if this will, that, that will also come into place here. That's the leadership today. Well, look at Blueprint, thanks now. Uh, as El Rafai briefs Buhari on labor crisis, Kaduna comes under tension of a tuition fees hike, student killed. So, uh, students were unruly, riotous, described to the police. NAST threatens to occupy Kaduna July 12th, meets Gumi. You know, this first word just appears as though, uh, especially after you see the first headline, as if it justifies the, uh, what happens in terms of the student killed, and then you see students were unruly, so, but you just need to read the story and we always get advice so you can put it in proper context so that, uh, you know, sometimes headlines might just uh, give you the wrong impression if you don't put it in proper context. Join ruling party, lose your seat, PDP tells Matawali. So, uh, they also, paper also reflects what you've seen uh, in some other dailies. So, well, uh, there you go. That is it. We'll look at some of the dailies here this morning. We're back in a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back. Well, that is what we're focusing on. As you've seen all that, welcome in Slider. The Electoral Act. In fact, all eyes on the National Assembly and the would-be Electoral Act. To be or not to be. And why not? Well, as you see, Mr. Mike Guinea joins us next. He is the resident Electoral Commissioner for Aquarium State. Good morning. He joins us uh, virtually. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Somebody, good morning. Good morning to Nigerians. Well, yes, indeed. A lot of focus will always be on the umpire when that time comes, among several other uh, agencies and uh, organizations concerning electoral management. But about this Electoral Act, which um, many have been waiting to see what becomes of it. Although they've said, uh, uh, I think June, now we're here, July, but at some point they say, well, we'll give it to you at some point. So give us your impressions about all of this debate making the rounds about passage of the Electoral Act. Well, thank you very much. Um, the issue of the passage of the Electoral Act Amendment B that has been in the works in the National Assembly 
is one that is of uh, utmost concern to all stakeholders across the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Um, with the benefit of insights, and on account of the very robust engagement that um, the Commission, particularly the Commission leadership, have been having with the National Assembly in the last few months, particularly the Chairman of the Commission who, uh, during the period of the committee sittings, uh, was there on daily basis from morning to the close of work, and the feelings we are getting from the interaction we are also having, um, we hope and believe that uh, despite um, the timeline that I earlier been given that has not been met, that uh, sooner than uh, Nigerian may respect, that uh, it will be passed. Because it's in the best interests of political class of our country and in particular, as some of the data I'm going to give to you in the course of this program will reveal that the National Assembly has been the greatest victim of our inability or failure to reform uh, our entire process, particularly with respect to the issues of primary election in Nigeria. So, as by way of uh, introduction, I want to say that uh, the need to pass the amendment uh, bill into law at least before the end of the year for the purpose of what we call the sanctity of the law cannot be overemphasized. Mm. Well, you know, uh, before you go to that data, uh, from what you've seen, perhaps the benefit of hindsight, um, and perhaps if the data is supported as well, do you think that uh, we actually learn from history? In this case, the National Assembly, did they learn from history? Well, quite frankly, I would say that um, generally Nigerians as a people, as a nation, the only thing that we learn is that we learn nothing from history at all. And interestingly, history has only really been the graveyard for contending opinions. As one who had followed Kili, political development in our country, and also now being involved at the gatekeeping exercise, is to, to me a matter of shock all through this period that we continue to go through the same negative trajectory with the result that the poetry of our election, the poetry of political party primary in, in our country has not been firmly framed in the rubric of litigations, of politications, chaos, frustration, and pain. Otherwise, it should have been expected that in a multi-party democracy, which is a system of regulated rivalry, conformity to party rules with respect to how can the match, would be a thing that should be taken for granted. Because the first primary duty of a political party in a democracy is the presentation of candidates for election. Now, after 1999, when we have been clamoring, as a matter of fact, we even need to clamor because a lighting self-interest detects that those who are actually the greatest beneficiary of our democracy should do things that will protect and preserve this democracy. But what do you find? And I give you a few statistics here as we go on. Political party primary, the choice of candidate, you know, John, Joseph Scopeter, he made the point a long time ago that look, that in a democracy, that in the final analysis, the choice of who are elected are basically choices already made 
by those who have influence and resources. And that the general public we are only being limited to the choices already made by other people. In fact, uh, perhaps uh, Robert Nike in his uh, work, The Iron Law of Oligarchy, he, he further went to exploit that, uh, expanded that uh, theory. But here's the point I want to make here. And that is that the failure to reform political party primary process in Nigeria has created a lot of problems since 2003 in particular. This is because by 1999, the experience will be having, terrible one indeed, since 2003, we really didn't have that because we were hurrying to get the military back to the, uh, to the barracks. So in 2003, we all made proposals to the National Assembly there that it should reform a primary process, given what had been going on. And for every general election, we've been doing that. In 2003, the result of that is that to tell you the greatest casualty, because some people have read in several places, and people have said, oh, in members of National Assembly don't want to do it. I don't agree with that, particularly the current leadership, the current National Assembly, on account of our engagement with the National Assembly, that this is going to be a different thing altogether. But just in case we have any of them who think otherwise, the following statistic will show that members of the National Assembly have been the greatest victim of failure to reform the primary electoral process in Nigeria, as well as other parts of the electoral process that will support and power INEC to do more than what we are doing now. In 2003, because of the failure to reform the electoral process, those who were elected in 1999 into the National Assembly that had the power to do all of this, they left the primary process to the hands of governors at the state level. Even though in an election that ordinarily if they are subjected to the electorate of their various constituency or senatorial district, they would have won the election. But because of that failure and leaving the entire power in the hands of executive at the state level, what happened? In 2003, a whooping 70% of members of the National Assembly did not return back to the National Assembly. Only 30% returned. Well, in 2003, just, just one moment. Yeah. Yeah, just, just one moment, uh, and I know that we have quite a long way to go in this conversation, um, but just what could INEC have done to mitigate this challenge you're talking about? Because challenge, the con question that comes to my own mind is, uh, why would the INEC, for instance, attend two primaries of one political party, choosing uh, candidates or a candidate for the same election? So is there anything you know, they, the INEC could have done to forestall that because, I mean, some would just say, isn't that supposed to be uh, whoever is signed off by the National Working Committee of a political party? Well, all, all primaries that um, I have um, under my watch as a commissioner will only be the primaries signed off by the National Executive. But, you see, the political parties have a way of sending their information in such a way that you are going to left, immediately they take you to, to the right. Then whichever way you look at all that they do, they will end up being in court. And so, and that is why the sanctity of the procedure, the need to reform the process is very key. And that is why the following data I am giving as we go further on this matter is very key. And we're going to address that further. In 2011, uh, 2007, those who were elected in 2003, there was a clamor. Don't forget that there were matters that have gone to Supreme Court on the issue about primaries. How candidates who have won election were just removed for what you call uh, flimsy reasons, not backed by law. What happened? between 2003 
and by 20, uh, 2007, 70 percent of members of the National Assembly that have the power to reform the process did not return back to the National Assembly. Only 24 percent came back to the National Assembly. By 2011, between 2007 and 2011, we were again in the electoral trenches calling on the need to reform the process because political party members have the right to make a choice and that most of the people that are not returning now, not necessarily because of that early June 11, they will not be able to return. But what happened in 2011, when it was not for 68% of members of the National Assembly who were elected in 2007 did not return back. Only 32% uh, came back. By 2015, again, those who were elected in 2011, 68% or 69% did not return. Only 31% returned back to the National Assembly. And the last electoral election, 2019, again, this is where we have a marginal uh, improvement. Only 56% returned. 44% did not return. Now, by 2023, I can give you a scenario. If we fail to do this amendment now and continue to leave the decision of who becomes what a candidate in an election in the hands of the executive at the state, which ought not to be, because what we are basically saying is non compliance. The situation is going to be worse for the members of the National Assembly. They are going to be the, big, the biggest victim and casualty by 20, 2023. What is the reason? The reason is that whenever you have a first term election on the part of executive and they are going for second term, as was indicated in 2019, after 2015, the likelihood to deny people tickets in their party because it may have impact on their own second term election. What happens? They will normally give them tickets. But now most of the state executive, they are now in their second term. And some of them may also be interested to want to go to the National Assembly. I in the seat of those who are seated there right now. And they have the right to do so. There's no question about that. But if I could just um these figures, which um, you say has got to do with um, the implications turnover. for yeah, the NAS turnover over time, which you associate with the non-passage of the electoral act. But in some of these years, I mean, can we wholly or to what percent, to what degree can we ascribe this turnover to non specific non-passage? of the electoral bill because i mean if you look at uh, uh right from 20, 2003 the electoral bill has not been in composition every assembly has it it has always been i want now want to explain that to you which is the question you've asked first and foremost i have told you that first duty of a political party in a democracy is to present candidate for election now and or if you look at the Republican Party, the Democratic Party that you have in America, that was formed in 1828, Democrat, Republican, 1854, you will hear them in America that they have what they call a register of members. Those who were the first people who registered when the party was formed, they have their numbers. Just like those of us who went to the university, my matriculation number when you enter university is given to you. And I still have it in the rest of my life. Today in Nigeria, political party do not have a credible register of their members. They do not have a credible register of their members. Two days ago, you heard our chairman and you heard several of us that the credibility of any election is predicated on the existence of a credible register of voters. How come, since 1999 to date, 
political parties in Nigeria cannot present to you a credible register of their members when it comes to the issue about party primaries. Section 87 of the Electoral Act stated specifically that you should either go for direct primaries or indirect primaries. As we all know, a direct primary represent the liberal dimension of liberal democracy because it gives opportunity for members of the political party to come and make a choice who should be a candidate in an election. But as we have seen over and again, they will opt for what we call indirect primaries. Now, the indirect primaries, one would have thought that you would rely on your register. But what do you hear? Caucus list, party list, in the place of register, now, the outcome of that is disputed political party primaries. The current amendment be because of the contribution that various stakeholders have made to him, Mr. Chabale, and Nigerians, which is the reason why I am confident, we are confident that it will be passed by the National Assembly, given the incredible industry that these members of NASA current leadership have put into the, into the current effort, is that Section 87 of the proposed amendments have done considerable work to sanitize the primary process in such a way and manner that in the unlikely event that if you are a member of a political party at the moment and you are unable to go through that process, in addition to other amendments that were also strengthening the commission in terms of the innovation that we are putting in place, you don't need to kill yourself. You can go to any other political party and you will win election in so far you have the support of members of that constituency, you will win election. So being in one party will no longer be an issue in Nigeria at all. That is what is contained in the current amendment. You see, the Yoruba man will say that, that is to say, if it is well with the hunter, it will be well with the hunter's back. If you have this amendment passed, Chamberlain, look at what they have done to Section 9 of the Electoral Act, the proposal that is there, take into account our amendment, Look at what they have done to Section 36 of the Electoral Act to obviate, to put sanctity over the situation that happened in Kogi State. That is to say, following the commencement of the election and just before the, the play announcement and declaration of the final winner, the candidate dies or the running mate dies. What we need to do is already provided for, unlike what happened in the Kogi period that had to matter to travel to the Supreme Court. They have dealt with that. Look at Section 49. That he had done that only two subsections. Section 49 in the proposal that we have submitted and what we have seen now have a total of 14, 14 subsections. 14 subsections detailing out, in fact, says section, section 49 and some other relevant section of the proposed amendment have their decision about violence. Those who think that they can use violence to win election in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. <laughs> Look, there will be no return to Egypt once this thing is passed. We, we know what is there. They know what is there. Chamberlain, At section, section 21. Uh, just section a moment. Uh, I'd like us to stay with that 87 because I recall what played out in Anambra State, you know, that letter that emanated from INEC and, you know, it got Abga saying, why interfere that much, or at least why paint, uh, you know, this process with a bad brush? And, and I recall the conversation was around, well, INEC should stay within its own ambit of the law and allow political parties do, you know, their internal workings and present a candidate without INEC interfering. So this new provision, you know, I, I see that, you know, it, it allows that all elective positions uh, shall be monitored and endorsed by the commission. Uh, don't you think this might also throw up uh, that conversation about INEC uh, maybe going beyond its bounds and interfering in internal party affairs? First and foremost, INEC is a creation of law. 
And may a day never come. May a day never come. When I neck, we have to decide a candidate for a political party. It will never happen. But as a creation, as a regulator, you must recognize that by virtue of third schedule paragraph 15 of the constitution of the fatherland, INEC is a regulator of elections. So the first task of any regulator is rulemaking in consonance with the powers given to us. Therefore, what we find quite interesting and revolutionary beyond what we have mentioned in section 87 is that some of those shenanigans that political parties indulge in, you will fix a primary for a particular day, for a particular venue, for a particular time, just a few hours to that time, you move it from there without notice to INEC, without notice to other members of the political parties, the current efforts have taken into account that such exercise where you fail to comply with giving notice of the venue publicly, you must publish all of these things. It will be a nullity. But as it is, you know, this is the reason why we are urging the National Assembly, if I will wish that it had been passed in the, in the, during the first quarter. Because some of the problems that you are having in Anambra State and perhaps if we don't this thing done before the 2023 election with respect to upcoming elections, is that we have got to a level in this country where political party candidates are not even no, no longer known before the election. This is a tragedy of our democracy that we go for elections. After election, we are still determining who is a candidate for election. It is shameful. It is disgraceful to our political elite. Now is the time for us to recognize that we require some level of ethical commitment to make progress in the area of our democracy. Section 87, the way I see it now, if passed, is going to be to the best interest of the political parties. Because the crisis that will normally affect election in terms of defining whether a general election will be peaceful, it starts with political party primaries. That is where the rain has been beating us since 2003 in particular. All right, well, we'll talk about the, the technology component of some of these when we return in a moment. Do stay with us. Welcome back. Well, you know, during the last elections, everyone, the world was just waiting, collation of results, announcement and verification of the results. That was an arduous one for lots of people. Harrowing it to a lot of journalists to wait on that, wait on INEC for that part. So if this passes and then you see where they say there shall not be full biometric accreditation of voters with smart card readers, and different technology that INEC will introduce from time to time. Give us a picture. What would you like to see? What will be the implication of that part if it is introduced and passed? Well, um, it's going to be very revolutionary because um, the ballots remain the best expression of the will of the people in a democracy. As a matter of fact, the whole embrace of democracy it's essentially because it brings about participation and accountability in the process of human development. And so, the process of this bill, in line with what we are doing, I mean, you just heard the chairman, our efforts to expand the radius of access of Nigerian people after 25 years, 25 years, that not be done today. We have been able to do that, creating 176,846 polling units across the Federal Republic of Nigeria that is status neutral based on data. If this is not complemented 
with what we are doing, and of course, with the new IVET, the INEC uh, voter enrollment device, in which case, by apart from the current exercise of registration, which we flagged up since yesterday, the online, by 2023, we are now going to do what we call both finger and facial accreditation for any reason for the in the unlikely event given that the system that coming up is a more robust more of a higher value than the previous machine we have the smart car reader we are now going to do what we call facial accreditation for any reason we are not able to get your finger you know uh, uh, confirmed we can also confirm your face so nobody can run away from that everybody we have to face that machine by 2023 because we want to protect preserve the sanctity of one person one vote in a democracy not one person multiple vote not one person you know having access to more than one so that is ongoing as reflected in the current effort that we are making but we need other stakeholders because we are playing our own part in this whole exercise i mean today in our bomb state from the previous 2979 pulling unit they have today they now have 4353 pulling units and as we have said since yesterday those of them who are now have embraced online you look at around the federal republic of nigeria today you don't see the kind of crowd you used to see before whenever we flag off you know uh cvr which actually under the current leadership uh, has taken a ton of continuous basis since on the 27th of april 2017 but for the pandemic and the issue of our election after 2019 this would have been ongoing so first we want to encourage everybody to continue that process now by on the 19th those who are, are doing the online you are expected to go to our office to have your biometric taken as well as the physical because there are two phases or two options for nigerians now we know that our mothers several nigerian people who are in the rural area they don't have laptop they don't have android have no access to internet we have also said look the traditional approach of course so that we can have your data and all of that that is also available as from on the 19th of july and in any case we have also created we have also created 2,672 centers across uh, 2,673 centers. You know, after the state level, the local government level, we have several of the four local government, but we have created additional 2,673 so that as many Nigerians who have not registered, and please to be noted, this exercise is not for a repeat. In any case, this time around, the system we have can easily detect any attempt, effort to want to, uh, if I will be denied that uh, process of going to re register. But so, fundamentally, the laws guiding this SSI Chamberlain, it should be adhered to. All because right, now, somebody, somebody can go up to as far as five years imprisonment. If you try to hinder, prevent Nigerians from registering, and if you are under age, of course, even if you go online, you think you're going to come to the office. For your so, it, it, gonna... from your experience in the field, uh, speaking about operationalizing some of those policies, this, this smart card functionality of the smart card readers in uh, some rural or some remote areas, we know that there could be challenges. Even in uh, urban areas, there are challenges too. So, how would you recommend uh, we all proceed with this one, such that when those challenges present themselves, they will not be an impediment to the ultimate intention of ensuring that the collision and announcement of results or transmission of results from those areas happen smoothly. Chamberlain, I think that what I need to remind Nigerians is what happened in Edo State and on those states. What happened in Ondo and in those states? I can tell you here that as a commission following the trajectory of progress and is supported by other stakeholders sooner than later 
Channel television, NTA, AIT, television station in the country, we will get a point using the model of Ondo and Edo State. You can make projection like the CNN. You cannot announce ele electoral, electoral result now, but you can make projection. And that's what we have done. Now, with respect to the new IVET, the INEG voter enrollment device, it is a, it's a, a system, it's an all round system that if charged, it use, you can charge it, electricity, it can also use battery and it will last for a very long time. I'm sure those of you go to the embassy uh, banks, you see some of those sophisticated things that they use in the bank. Because right now, it is 4442. 442. That's what we are doing basically now. The way you cannot hide, Chamberlain, is your face. You may lie, or you, I mean, there could be collusion that each have a fingerprint, but in any case, the things that are contained in that amendment are very, very important. They are very, very important to help drive what we are doing at the moment. So uh, when challenges will come, I can tell you that we have the capacity to do that. Interestingly and commendably, uh, some of the things we are coming up are also designed by our engineers. And kudos, I mean, you could know, you know that Nigerians are uh, given the, um, the, the, the opportunity. We'll do very well. The problem we have- Yeah, and, and you know, uh, as a matter of fact, the political Wait. elite are responsible for the worry tendency that is putting our democracy at risk. The we'll follow up on that elite. soon. But you know, uh, much as everyone would love that for the media to be able to make those projections, I think the print, uh, print uh, colleagues can. Uh, I'm not sure which law bars them, but for the broadcast industry, those projections you can't be made. Now. You yeah, because the NBC code has got to. We need to maybe amend it to accommodate some of these things. But just as you say, oh, no. if INEC does this, I don't think the NBC code or the lawmakers will shy away from ensuring that the broadcast uh, medium is not left behind to all of this. So it, it will be a welcome one, I reckon. But let, let, me, let me ask you this, uh, Mr. Guinea. Um, we all know that at some point in 2015, the, we couldn't go, the president didn't sign uh, the, the, the bill into law, I think it was uh, 2019, because according to him, it was too late, uh, too close to the elections. It's one year, seven months, and 23 days before February 23, 2023. When is it too late to change the Electoral Act before the next election? Ayo, in our well-considered assessment and opinion, if passed today, if passed tomorrow, all well and good. Because the sanctity of the law, that this is the law guiding the process, is very key for the participants. Because laws are enablers and also constraint to wrong behavior. But where we are right now, on account of what I have said, in a, when we speak, we speak out of conviction of people we have engaged with, that the situation of 2019 is unlikely to happen this time around. Because it's in our best interest, in the interest of our democracy, to do so. Because in the final analysis, I, you see, J.F. Kennedy, on the, on the night of January 1961, he won people who are elected to public office and those who are appointed that there will be a high court of history that will sit in judgment over all those who have been elected into public office or appointed like us. And that at that sitting, will be asked the following question. Were you dedicated to the service of your country where you had the opportunity to be there? Do you Mr. Guinea. Mr. Guinea, just, just, one moment, so, just one moment, just one moment, just a moment. Yes, just a moment. 
I, I want us to be, I just want it to be clear. Uh, you know that the same National Assembly that you are very, so very confident that they will, you know, they, they, they will do the need for, as we are all expecting, have uh, shifted the, the goalposts like twice. Uh, first it was supposed to be passed, I think in December or so, and then it was moved to March, and then to June, now it's been moved to July. For whatever reason, good intentions of the National Assembly or whatever, there could be a reason to not pass it based on some national interests. Now, where you sit as a major player in INEC, in the electoral process in Nigeria, what time is too late for us to change the Electoral Act? What time is it too late? Well, I can say, Ayo, to you here, that assume that is never happening. That even 24 hours with respect to that's the one that relates to us in our process. 48 hours to election. That some of the things that we are developed that are sustainable, replicable, that they are passed even 48 hours to that election for us is hallelujah. But where I have concern is we respect to rules the uh, profound amendment relating to party primary that need to be sanitized. Right now you have an abra election, you are going to have other offices in election coming. If you don't have, in fact, that of Anambra cannot be, whatever we are having that it passed can no longer be applicable to Anambra state. That's the area of concern that we have. And the feelers we are getting from National Assembly is that it will be done. You refer to the last uh, year, the previous year, before the 2019 election. Don't also forget that even between and among them, there were issues about change of schedule of uh, election. Oh, suddenly they want the National Assembly to come. You know, there were all kinds of, even the division among themselves. All of those confusion, you know, were all part of what uh, perhaps led to uh, what happened at that time. But in any case, as a commission, I must assure Nigerians here that in all of this, there are things we won't say now. When we get to the bridge, we will say those things to the Nigerian people, that they be assured that under the current leadership of Mambud, and thank God some of us will still have the privilege of serving the fatherland, who will stand tall and mighty in defense of this democracy and the rule of law that we fought for so that we can have a society where there is opportunity for all a responsibility for all through choice making of the kind of leaders that we'll have by creating the ambience for the Nigerian people to make that choice. But with respect to this bill, uh, on account of uh, sustained engagement by the leadership of the National Assembly, uh, with the National Assembly leadership and its members, particularly committee members, I hope this is going to be a different ballgame. Okay. Well, there was something you mentioned earlier and uh, uh, about the governor's influence uh, in the primaries, in the party primaries in their various states. Is that in any way indicting the governors on the outcome of the primaries and consequently culpable for the series of uh, litany of litigations as a result of those primaries? I hope. You see, we must learn to tell ourselves inconvenient truths. And the unhappy truth, having referred to the poetry of our primary now frame in the rubric of litany of litigations for social and pain, the fact that it's common knowledge that the governors at the state level, they make no determination. In fact, what they are doing, like I said, which is consistent with what scholars have written over before, just a scope time. 
that who becomes what in any political party is first and foremost decided by those who have influence and power. That's what Scripita, Joseph Scripita said a long time ago. So, today, who becomes a candidate, a counselor, is determined by a governor. Who becomes a, a council chairman is determined by a governor and a few people around who are very influential. This is your happy truth. All right? Who becomes a member of the House of Assembly is a governor. As a matter of fact, the situation has even changed under the current uh, dispensation. Be before now, even governors, apart from choosing councillor candidate, choosing sitters of assembly, choosing the members of national assembly, they also determine for a president who should become a minister. That used to be what happened before. They want to determine to be a minister from, from the state and all that. Today, Ayo, do I need to be talking about in that way? You know that today in the Federal Republic of Nigeria, local government system is gone. It's gone because independent-minded people are not allowed to aspire to be candidate of a political party. So when you get in there, eh, with the joint state local government account, they give you what they give to you after you have no job before. Who are you to challenge the use of that money? Two, members of national status of assembly in this country today, the unhappy truth in our democracy is that it's only the national assembly that we speak about that have shown independence, that we are seeing, you know, engagement with the executive at the state level, the state house of assembly are under the total control of the governors. That is the truth of the matter. We all know this. That is the inconvenient truth. And for us to make progress, we must move away from this unsavory part because that's why the state house of assembly, when the national assembly try to give them autonomy, they voted against their own independence. The people voting against their own independence. How best do you know what's going on? So really, this is where we are as a people. So the democracy we are talking about that from 1999, really, you know, we were looking forward to getting to the point of what we call democratic consolidation. Because when you get to a point of democratic consolidation, it reduces electoral volatility which is characterizing our environment at the moment and reducing the number of people in participation. You don't need to even uh, uh, follow the law, even the register political party, as we have done legally, constitutionally. Because if at the local government system, the political parties we have today, as many 18 of them that we have today, and in a truly, truly content local government system, the, the time that I met in 1999 that the various political parties you won across the Federal Republic of Nigeria, it is not unlikely that, for example, a state that have 20 local government or 30 local government, you know, that one party, no matter how small, could win a local government, could win two local government. Once they win two local government and all of that, it means that you cannot take their money other than the money of the, the, the ruling party of that state controlled by that particular uh, political uh, party. What that happened, Ayo, you know the implication? Local government system will be run differently. So if a party, uh, a small party today, out of uh, 20 local government, it has won uh, three local government, they will run that differently, all right? And by the next local government election, others want to vote for that party, particular political party. But today, democracy is dead. It's dead at the level of local government system in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And, it's and, and we see... Oh, uh, Mr. Guinea, we, I mean, we see the work uh, being done to try to revive, you know, that d dead democracy you reference. But I imagine that as the, you know, the National Assembly is working with INEC and other bodies to, you know, get this Electoral Act Amendment Bill at least uh, to come to fruition. I imagine that the political actors, the governors you referenced, are also amending their own rules of engagement and the ways and manner in which they conduct these things. I mean, they want to also stay ahead uh, of whatever it is the commission and, and, you know, and other agencies are planning to ensure that we have a better process. So the question will be, you've mentioned some of these challenges. Does this amendment provide enough deterrence? Because like I said, you, I mean, you've referenced people that have influence and power, and basically that means money resources. So if, if you say that this direct and indirect primary has to be monitored properly, I mean, they can go to start, you know, uh, giving financial incentives, vote buying and the rest. So do we have enough deterrence to ensure that whichever way they go, whichever way it swings, you're always ahead of them? Look, i tell you, you see, when I speak with the level of 
of uh, excitement, you know, uh, over this current, uh, the, what is in the National Assembly in the works is based on what I have seen. That if passed, we are going to make tremendous progress in our electoral system in the country. Because the current effort is not only addressing the behavior of the political class, supporters, it's also addressed INEC, the umpire. If INEC staff, whether ad hoc, for any reason, decide to announce results other than the expression of the will of the people in a democracy, some of the sanctions that are contained in the current effort are those that you don't even have the option of fine. You could go as long as five years, J10, seven years, after some of those provisions. And the as we wind down test, on this, give us your impression about... The of law yeah, my, give us your impression opinion. as we wind down on this uh, segment. Uh, what do you think about independent candidacy with respect to logistics of INEC and such matters? Um, Chamberlain, the problem we are having today in our system is not about whether we don't have independent candidates. That is not the problem. Because all these other small political parties, apart from the two major political parties, they are basically a platform for independent candidates. And that's why people can just move and all of that. That's not the problem. The, the problem is how do candidates emerge? The opacity around that process have to be dealt to it. You can see what we have done as a commission. We are making progress. In Edo and on those uh, states. In other democracies <laughs> where they've got uh, at least an improved system of where candidates emerge, they still do have independent candidacy. No, I am not saying that um, we should not have independent candidacy. I am saying that looking at our problems, the demerit of our problems, if you put them, you know, in hierarchy, I am telling you that all those platforms, they are not in bed independent candidate kind of platforms. That is not the problem we are having right now. The problem we are having is the attempt by political class to undermine the integrity of the electoral process. And that's why you see the issue about uh, apathy. People are, 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 um, are moving away, not wanting to vote. Look at violence. And again, we must ask ourselves about the neutrality of other key actors on the part of INEC who will remain neutral because the key value that undermine that, under, uh, that, that, that reflect our work must be integrity, impartiality. That will also come from the security system because as we are beginning to see, should we have a system where in a state, for instance, between, even within a party, Security should be in the hands of some key actor or member of the political party to be used at their direction against other members of the political party. The answer is no. If you can skate further in a general election, should security be neutral or be seen to be on the side of one group against the other? All right, then. Not what should happen. So, so I want to say that Chamberlain, the effort in the National Assembly, what we are putting there, what the media, and I must commend the media for all your effort, because we must be grateful to the media, because all the triumph will not have happened without the role of the media. That's the only way we can go in order to have a democracy to right. be proud of. All right, and thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Mike Guinea, Resident Electoral Commissioner for Akwai Boom State. We're back in a moment. Stay with us. Well, indeed, that is our guest this morning as introduced, the GMD, that's the Group Managing Director of the NNPC, Nigeria's oil company, is our guest this morning. Mr. Melekiari, welcome to Sunrise Daily. Thank you very much and good morning. I do feel like a very lucky fisherman this morning, even though I had absolutely nothing to do with catching this fish. But I mean, so every day you host the NNPC GMD in your studios. Welcome to Sunrise Daily once again. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Well, this morning, 
as if the dailies already knew that you might be coming, uh, some of the stories on the front pages this morning uh, make reference to some of the issues which we hope to be discussing. Uh, that particular report talked about the launch of Operation White, the second phase of Operation White. In the first phase, we had seen the closure of the borders. That's correct? That's correct. Uh, this time around, are we going to be seeing another closure of the borders? Absolutely not. The Operation White was actually happened during the border closure. So Operation White did not close the border. Okay. Thank you. Well, it happened during the border closure. Yes. But one of the benefits that we saw was that yes. smuggling of our products was reduced. reduced. That... Absolutely. Okay. Yes. So, so this time around, it's not going to... The border is not closed. Yes. We're still going to carry forward the Operation White uh, activities to curtail cross-border smuggling. The, that story is very important because if you look at what we have on the front page of the punch this morning, they have this border corruption, security agents, smugglers, wasn't subsidy crisis, flout Buhari's order. That's the front page of the punch this morning. I don't know if you've seen it at all. Yes, of course I did. Uh, obviously, flouting the order may not be correct. Uh, I think that's not the uh, proper way of putting it uh, because uh, smugglers are there to flout anyone's order. So obviously it's not about others, it's about the realities that are around us. Uh, first, let me just step back uh, to see what exactly are we dealing with. Uh, we know for sure that our petroleum or PMS consumption or petrol consumption in this country is not up to 60 million liters. We are very sure it is not up to that number. But we supply up to 60 million liters for very obvious reasons. Any time you do short of that, you see the scarcity on our streets. And what we call consumption today in the country is actually evacuation from fuel depots. That means we evacuate up to 60 million liters average in a month out of, um, that's on daily basis now, uh, most average comes around 60 million liters. So we always plan with 60 million liters because we know that any time we do below that number, we have a crisis. And the difference is uh, the realities around us. First, we agree also that there are sharp practices uh, which we are trying to contain. But more importantly, you have what is uh, called the organized cross-border smuggling of petroleum, which is associated with the pricing of petroleum itself. Uh, as we are aware, uh, today we are paying 162 naira to the litre. I'm sure many people buy AGO in the market today. And uh, I just saw as I was coming AGO to... AGO is diesel. It's diesel, yes. Uh, diesel is selling at 280 naira to the, to the litre. So nowhere in the world, diesel sells uh, cheaper than, uh, more expensive than than PMS. That means that the price of petrol anywhere in the world, assuming you're going to sell it at the market, you're going to sell it at be above that price that you have seen in, in the market. So that is number one uh, challenge that we have. The second challenge is that we are bordered with countries that have no choice. Landlocked countries, uh, yes, the number of vehicles that they have is quite lower than what we have, but the reality today is that you have to transport petroleum into this country by road. In some cases, uh, by pipeline, very marginal case, uh, only in Ghana that goes off north into the north of the country where petroleum is transported to other countries. Otherwise, all the movement of petroleum in, a, in, a, in the West African sub-region and beyond this is by trucks. So these countries have no choice, my sister. Uh, first, uh, there are issues of foreign exchange. And many of them cannot raise such high foreign exchange to meet their balance of payment requirements. Uh, because uh, petroleum is expensive now, crude oil sales are about $75 to the barrel, and then we're going to need an enormous amount of foreign exchange to support this. So that's another complication that we have. And the arbitrage that is real uh, helps uh, grow this uh, issue around smuggling. And of course, Mr. President, well, that's, I'm sure that's why they are coming out plotting this order. Mr. President has directed that we do everything possible to make sure that we pull down this volume, that we cannot explain that cross-border smuggling is taking place as a reason for having problem with this. So tell us then, when the borders were shut and, you know, what was, what was Nigeria consuming? Yeah, the evacuation was around 52 million liters per day to 53 million liters per day. So and during million, the COVID-19, when, yeah. when absolutely was, that was not longer an issue of border closure because yeah. the markets were not there, it came down to about 42 million liters per day. That means that... Uh, uh, if everything works well and consumption is limited to our country, we are dealing with somewhere around 42 uh, million liters of consumption. Because during the COVID-19, mind you, if you don't forget, uh, if we, Nigerians do, can remember, uh, during the COVID-19, you know, there was lockdown for some time, but there was no absolute lockdown in this country. So municipal movements as, were still going on despite all the restrictions that we have. And there was a period of about two weeks when you know, absolute movement were curtailed. But thereafter, you know, it wasn't curtailed. So 
when you look at it and the cross border, because many of these countries were actually so more successful than us in shutting down their countries uh, during that, that period. And the end result is that there was no longer any need for the cross border uh, smuggling because the, the customers will not have buyers. And during that period, we saw the consumption go down, or consumption now, or the evacuation from the depots around 42 million liters per day. What's and this the, kind of reflects what the realities could be. What's the landing price of petrol today? Today, uh, landing, maybe, I, what I can remember, so that I don't give you the wrong number, so what I can remember, I checked the numbers two days ago. Uh, what would we sell if we are at the fuel station today and recover our cost fully? It's around 256 naira to the liter. If you were to recover your cost fully, but yeah, when you uh, land at the, at the uh, borders, at the ports rather, yeah. the landing yeah, yeah, cost? That would be lower than that okay. because there are other costs that are associated with transporting the fuel from the port, port into the fuel stations. Mm. That I can't remember the numbers. There was a time when the NNPC did say there was no longer subsidy being paid. In fact, that Nigeria was fully deregulated. We are in a fully deregulated market. What went wrong? Yes, uh, March, precisely March, last, last, late March uh, 2020, uh, there is a decision of government for us to deregulate the price of petroleum. We saw an opportunity because the market uh, price of petroleum went down substantially. It was far lower than the 145 naira to the liter that we were selling at that time. Actually, we brought down the price to 125 naira to the liter because that was the realities at that time that we could sell uh, at below the 145 and still recover our cost fully, a little more, even more than our cost at that time. So we saw that as an opportunity for us to walk out of the, the regulated environment. Nobody sold anything. Uh, people clapped for us that uh, all is well. We are now selling petroleum below market at market price. Of course, uh, over time, uh, COVID-19's effects started waning down and, and ultimately, uh, we ended up with uh, petroleum prices hitting the one above the 145 around September last year. And that was the beginning of our conversation with uh, organized labor and civil society organiza organizations and the issue around, oh, you are now pulling out subsidy fully, you can't do this, and that engagement has uh, started. By November, the prices have gone to around 162 naira to the liter when, if you are to sell at market in the fall station. So those engagements and all the crises that followed it, I'm sure you recall the answers and all that, they're all associated, they're all connected. And ultimately, engagement with organized labor started, and up to the end of February, we were not able to close that engagement. February this year, we weren't able to close those engagements with organized labor so that we can have a fully deregulated market environment. So the, the challenges are that um, realities that we can afford it, uh, but also the second reality is that if you don't do something smart, that you could end up throwing up prices at Nigerians that are well above uh, what they should pay for. And that's the concern of Mr. President, to make sure that, look, contain two things, contain the volume, and also make sure that the pricing is appropriate even when you, when you have to move into that direction. And this is the engagement that are going on. We haven't closed it. It will not be this month. It will probably not be next month also. And, and, and of course, there are engagements that are going on. But ultimately, the end result is that uh, uh, at one point in time, not today, uh, probably, but uh, the engagement is aimed at making sure that uh, at least there is a reasonable level of uh, pricing that we can do that will recover the cost. What we are doing today is uh, responsible for many other things, and uh, that means you are taking out cash for what you have done, what you should have done for other things to pay for uh, the cost of petroleum. Well, we had the former Minister of Finance talk, to, talk about an under-recovery in NNPC. Yeah. Is that still, still the situation? Yes, under recovery means uh, NNPC goes to the market, buys petroleum, brings into this country, we should have sold it at 256 naira to the liter, we sell it in the market at 162 naira to the liter. So you are not able to recover your full cost. They are the same thing. Under recovery and subsidies are one and the same word. That's correct? Not exactly. When you say subsidy, you spend and you are paid back. That's the difference. So, what is so in under recovery, happening? because I have the resources in my hands, I buy it, I'm not able to recover, and nobody is paying NMPC for, for the subsidy. It's simply our cost of operation. We deduct that cost before we make available what's the balance of the resources in our hands. So that's the difference. Okay. So as but what we, you, are, you are literally as paying for uh, the difference between the market price and what you are selling. But it's the issue of difference of timing and then the channel of that payment. So... As a result, NNPC is subsidizing the Nigerian market, but it's not being able to recover the, the monies that it is Absolutely. paying as subsidies to the Nigerian market back from the federal government. Is that correct? Yes, what it means is that NNPC is bringing in product, selling that below market. We have resources of the state. We sell crude oil on behalf of the Federation. Uh, We're supposed to recover the whole value of that crude oil paid into the Federation account. Because our balance sheet cannot carry 
those uh, losses, you know, we, we are now in a way, we are owing the Federation, yes, we have your resources with you, we brought product and salt on, on your behalf, but we're not able to recover the full cost. Therefore, put it on your records that we are not able to return it. That's why it is called under recovery. Okay. Yeah. Now, as a result of this, you have said that the NNPC might not be able to remit much into the Federation account come June or July. Is that correct? Yes, because you cannot have the absolute number. There's an expectation in the, in the Appropriation Act for NNPC to deliver at least 120 billion naira every month to the Federation account. And mind you, uh, the, there's a misunderstanding around our operations uh, to our community. It's a very good opportunity to explain this. When you see oil and gas, you have to produce oil, you have to produce gas. Once you do these two, uh, you must pay taxes, you must pay uh, royalties. And then these taxes and royalties will not happen until you have a production that is made. So it's our first job is to make sure that we produce oil and gas. And NMPC and our partners are responsible for 80% of the production of oil and gas. So do, and there's a process for a relationship between us and our partners. For instance, uh, in the joint venture arrangement, it's a very good opportunity also to explain this. You know, everybody takes his share of his, uh, his production on the basis of your contributions that you're making to this business. And from there, you are expected to pay your taxes, your royalties, and share dividend to your, 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 your shareholders. But you have to take out your cost. It's always the, the truth. Uh, so you have to take out your cost before you see the value that is left for you from the process that are in your, in your hand. So cost of production will look appear very high because it is, that is what keeps the operations going on. That's what makes it possible for everybody else, including our partners, to pay their taxes and royalties. So you see revenue flow coming from three streams. You see the petroleum property tax coming in from the FIRS. You see royalties coming from the Department of Petroleum Resources. And also the, the balance of it comes from the NMPC. For NMPC, for us to continue to keep the operations, we have to pay for the cost of that operation. So when you take out the cost of operation, you are left with some value that would have flown in into the Federation account. Now you have to deal with the issue of petroleum uh, uh, pricing. So you have no other way of doing it because you cannot create that cash and therefore you are short of that value in paying into the Federation account. That's why when you say, oh, NMPC is going to make load declaration into Federation account, it's actually connected to the cost of our operation, particularly settlement of the cost of petroleum that we are, we are all dealing with. So in real sense, even you say NMPC is zero, not correct because that's not what happened in June. But uh, the values that the Federation will expect from us will not be realized as long as we have this structure around the under recovery of the price of petroleum. I didn't so, use the word zero. Apparently, yeah. the word zero was, sought, was said to have come from you, that there will be zero remittance to the Federation account. Um, into it, it was a projection. Yes. Uh, we have a responsibility every month to tell the Federation account that in the coming three months, uh, this is what we see based on our estimates of all our cost of production, estimate of cost of the petroleum that we have to deliver into the market. So on the basis of that, we say we, it may be zero, but it, turn, it didn't turn out to be zero. Estimates become real when the actual numbers come up. Mm. Yeah. Let me quickly flip this to Lagos. I'm sure there are lots yeah. of issues that they would like to um, bring to your attention. Gentlemen. All right, so if you could tell us, because, I mean, there's been a lot of commentary about the rationale behind uh, the... Uh, NNPC acquiring stake in Dangote Refinery. Could you shed some light on that? Let me start from the, the obvious, which is that Dangote Refinery will come to work. Uh, by 2022, it should come into production. And what that will do is to deliver over 50 million liters of gasoline, in, to be specific, into, the, in our, into our markets. We're also working on that. We have a connection. We're also working on our refineries uh, to make sure that we put the, fix them. We have awarded the contract for Potaco Refinery Rehabilitation. And, and ultimately, we are going to close that of Wari and Kaduna very soon in July so that all of them will work contemporaneously and at the end of the day, we we'll deliver all of them. The net effect is that you're going to have an environment where Nigeria becomes a hub for petroleum product supply. And it's going to change the the dynamics of petroleum supply, even in globally, in the sense that the flow is coming from Europe today and is going to be reversed to some other direction, will be the supplier for West Africa legitimately and also many other parts of the world. So the meaning of this is that there's an opportunity that has thrown at us. And I'm not sure Mr. Damgote wants to sell his uh, equity in the, in the uh, refinery. I can confirm that it was at our instance that we started this engagement. He did not want to sell these uh, shares in this refinery. I'm sure Nigerians will agree with me that many people have shares in Dangote Sugar, Dangote, uh, all kinds of things that he's doing. That if he has thrown, up, thrown it open to the market, and I'm sure Nigerians will rush to buy shares. Having said that, 
There is no resource dependent country that will watch a business of this scale which has bordering on energy security, which also has implication of even fiscal security of our country, and you watch it and you ha don't have a say. And for us as a strategy, it just didn't start there. We started this process long before Dangote came on, uh, started his uh, refinery project. We have this will take equity in very significant businesses that are anchored on the oil and gas operations. Fertilizer, methanol plants, you know, small modular, uh, so small condenser refineries, and so many other businesses that we're, we're dealing with, so that we can expand our portfolio. But also, because we are the national oil company, we have a responsibility to guarantee energy security for our country. And there's no way you can have that say, except you have a say in the board of this institution. And that's why anyone that is going to construct a refinery that is in the excess of 50,000 barrels per day, we'll talk to them, we'll take equity in it as much as we are, going to, we are going to be able to pay for it. And by the way, let me give you a comfort, you know, even for this refinery, Dangote refinery, we're not going to take government money to buy it. That's the mistake that people are making. They thought that we're going to take federation money and pay for this refinery. We're going to borrow on the back of the cash flow of this business. We know that this business is viable, it will work, and that it will return dividend. It has a cash flow that is sustainable because refinery business, you know, in the short term, Will continue to be sustain, sustainable and that's why banks have come forward to lend to us so that we can take equity in this so we are not putting anything at stake and of course uh, more importantly what you see in the media today i'm sure that's that's why what will interest you a uh, number of very adverse uh, reports in you know, a clearly political some of them but obviously shut up the facts uh, to, to to say the least uh, as, uh kind of alluding to facts that you know this was an inappropriate uh, investment i think we're very proud that we did this this is good for our shareholders, which includes all the 200 million Nigerians, uh, which will also be happily buying shares from this refinery if they have an opportunity. But now we have done on your behalf, so that ultimately the value will come to all of us. But there's no way you can watch a business of this scale, of this magnitude, of this sensitivity to run without an involvement of the national oil company. No country does this. Well, just one uh, other thing that one we want to ask you. Um, that's Dangote Refinery, it's private, and I'm pretty sure it's perhaps just as you have said, we want to replicate the same template wherever we have the opportunity. But how about Nigeria's own private, Nigeria's own refineries, the PH Refinery, the Wari Refinery, the Kaduna Refinery? What's the update on them? I understand the governor of Edo State said recently that the Edo Refinery is ready for production uh, as soon as um, signed off by the DPR. So what's the update on those other refineries that Nigeria already has? Yes, first, uh, what we are dealing with is not turnaround maintenance for Potakot. We are dealing with rehabilitation of a refinery. We own up that uh, we haven't done well managing this refinery in the last 20 to 25 years. Uh, our processes didn't help matters. Of course, we don't want to blame, blame the past, but the reality is that we haven't done well managing those refineries. And we are in a situation where you are almost doing an overhaul of a sort. It's no longer a, a turnaround maintenance. That's why we took our time to find out exactly what do we need to do. Uh, we have awarded the EPC contract for Potapa Refinery. Contractor has mobilized to site. We have made substantial progress in this and we will meet our schedules in terms of the Potapa Refinery rehabilitation. And secondly, we have the two other refineries, Wari and Kaduna. We will award the, ten, uh, the, the EPC contract for Kaduna and Wari within the next two to three weeks, uh, maximum by the end of July, so that these two processes will run, run uh, uh, concurrently so that at the end of the day, uh, you have all the refineries working, our own refineries working, and by the way, also, you know, I'm just giving uh, this uh, very critical to, uh, to Nigerians that we're not going to take any government money to, uh, to rehabilitate this refinery. We are borrowing also on the back of the cash flow of these refineries. And this is what is different. Uh, because when you do at the back of the cash flow, it means that you have a system and a process that will enable you to uh, deliver you know, commercially. And that's why we have changed the whole concept. Uh, part of the requirement of the lenders is that we should not operate this refinery. We must have an O&M contract. It means operation and maintenance contract. So that means practically this refinery will be run by the lenders. This is really what it means. And that the cash flow will be able to support repayment of this loan. The bankers have seen that the cash flow will be able to support this. So ultimately, uh, as the Land Refinery Initiative comes up, you know, we're also going to fix our own. We have other initiatives which uh, the governor of Edo State was alluding to. First, we have initiatives around condenser refinery. What it means is that condensers are very light version of uh, crude oil. Let me put it in this uh, basic way. It's much cheaper to combat to petroleum product, and it, typically it comes very light end petroleum products, and, and of course, especially uh, petrol. They are cheaper to construct, quicker to con construct, 
And also, it, it takes out the burden of the open quota restriction that you have. So we have about five initiatives that are going on. We are going to take FID on two of them uh, within the next two to three months. And that means that they will run and ultimately the combined effect of all of them is about 200,000 barrels per day of condensate refining cap capacity. When you add this up, the, our own refineries that are current, the new refinery initiative that we are involved in, and then the Dangote refinery, the ultimately you are going to have a massive production in this country that will, will not be able to consume. And that means it puts us in the position of advantage first. It gives us the energy security that we desire and we need. It also allows us to benefit much more from the resources that we have because if you don't add value to petroleum, it's just like uh, buying granite and taking it to the market and you are not ready to convert it to a secondary product. So right. this is what's happening. Uh, mm. It is almost a, a miracle in our country, but we know that this will be delivered. So uh, if you could just put a figure to it, because as you've referenced, there's, there's been a lot of reports on, on, on various media about just how much that equity is worth. What's the particular figure and has it been signed and sealed just yet? Not at all. Our, our engagements that we have signed term sheets with the owners of the refinery, I'm not sure Mr. Dangote is very happy with this. Uh, we are taking 20% equity on the Dangote refinery. There's a valuation process. It's very international. This business is very regulated. It's a very international business. No bank will lend money to you to buy equity in any business of this scale if you have not followed the basic valuation process. And that's why what, what you see in the media is no reflection of the realities. Uh, people have not taken their time to ask those questions and to find out exactly how these things are done. We understand this, uh, uh, the politics around some of this. But the, the reality today is that uh, uh, we have a valuation of this refinery about one point, uh, uh, I'm not sure, about 19 billion. I don't have an exact figure, but I think about 19 billion. We haven't closed on this to answer your question straight. There's an ongoing engagement. There's a governance around this that we need to conclude. Uh, that governance includes uh, seeking the authority of the Federal Executive Council to close on this. And what you see in the media is not a reflection of the realities that are on ground. We are not taking 30% equity in the Dangote refinery. You hear all kinds of speculations. There is a hastened uh, process of endorsement of the, the deal itself. It is not true. Actually, we started this conversation well back in December 2020. And, and obviously, uh, it's not what we rush into this. We have taken all our steps, all the international processes for evaluating the worth and value of a refinery are taken into place. Our banks are comfortable with it, that they believe that this is the, the actual value and that even when you overvalue, for instance, you know, for the sake of argument that you hear, it's seen thrown up in the, in the media, mm -hmm. that even overvalue, the banks will not lend you money because they know that you're not going to recover your cost. So they have no business in lending you because your you repayments are tied to you. You say it's a highly regulated industry. Yeah. The problem in Nigeria is that the NNPC is both regulator and also participator in the market. So it's regulated by who? No, what I mean by regulated, uh, uh, this industry, I didn't mean about petroleum product. NMPC does not regulate anything. We're a business. What I mean by regulated, is there are rules that you cannot change in the oil and gas industry. For instance, if you want to buy equity in anything, there's a process that you must follow. If you don't, nobody will, is going to lend to you. So to that extent, your hands are tied. So you cannot say... Oh, by nobody, you mean nobody in the Nigerian market or nobody... Anywhere, anywhere in the world. Mm. That, that's, what, that's how it works. You know that a lot of people have huge questions about NNPC. There Absolutely. have been, you know, questions about how it operates. It was not until only recently that the NNPC yeah. issued its own audited reports. Before yeah. now, it has yeah. not been sent in a very long time. Yeah. Uh, the question a number of people have, because they understand that it's important for the Nigerian government to have stakes in that sort of industry, whether or not, you know, the restructuring that is coming as a result of the PIB, how it's going to influence the relationship between the NNPC and Dangote Refinery, mm -hmm. whether it's will still be allowed to run as a private refinery or, or, or whether the operations of the NNPC will impose inefficiencies on the Dangote refinery. What are your, questions, what are your answers on that? Yes, the answer is, is a threat. Um, first of all, I think uh, is, is, this is history. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. This is history, Matt. Uh, this company, in its 43 years of operations, it has never published its audited financial statements. We did for 2019, we're going to 2018, we've done for 2019, and we'll publish our 2020 audited financial statement. That's, I haven't said that, you know, this is also a matter of obligation, it's, but we are required by law to do this. I don't want to explain why we couldn't do it in the past, but we have done this under the leadership of Mr. Mr. President. We insisted that we must open our books to, to the shareholders of this company. Secondly, this is the only company, I'm, I'm inviting Nigerians to go to the NNPC website, every transaction that we have done, every barrel of crude oil that we have sold on behalf of this country, 
including the working documents are now published in our website. So mm. anyone can check. Well, the question is, is the relationship between mm. the NNPC and Dangote Refinery, how is that Yes, I'm coming, to I'm, I'm, I'm coming to that. We're almost out of time, sir. If you can do it in 30 seconds. It's, it's going to work. work because in the sense that, you know, uh, it's a karma company. The refinery is going to be a karma company. It means that its books has to be open to all of us and to all the shareholders. And therefore, we don't have any problem. We have, we'll have a stake in this refinery. We'll be part of the management of that company in the sense that we'll be sitting on the board. And, and ultimately, the value will come back to Nigeria. You know, looking at the fact that the, that oil is priced in dollars, and you hope to be given crude to the to the Dangote refinery, mm -hmm. how is that going to affect the pricing of petroleum products here in Nigeria ultimately? Petroleum is priced in Naira in our country. You buy crude oil in U.S. dollars, so it's, it is really a ba banking transaction uh, between customers. Therefore, when you want to buy crude oil from, from us, you buy the U.S. dollars. So the central bank is there to resolve all those issues around banking. The banking industry, I'm not sure there's really any complication. Nigeria will not pay for product in, Naira, in, in dollar. Of course, it will be in Naira, but that is the duty of uh, the banking institutions to, to combat those value into U.S. dollars. I think for a number of Nigerians, what they would really like to see is a little more clarity in terms of the relationship and how it will ultimately benefit Nigerians. Because the, the quarrel and the crisis has always been that Nigeria produces crude oil and as such should not be paying so much uh, for landing cost of petrol when the product is actually produced right here in the country. The first thing it does for you, to it takes up the cost of freight, which is amounts the average of about 21 naira to the litre. That's the first benefit Nigerians will have. Even if, uh, today, for instance, the product that we're bringing in, they're imported, that's why it's priced at around 256 if you are selling the market. If you are to take it from any of our refineries today and they are functioning, you would have taken out 21 naira straight from it. That's the first level of... Uh, uh, of, of, of value that will come to Nigeria. The second value is proximity to supply. Because today, when you buy a petroleum product in Europe, it takes at least 14 days to arrive to this country. Here, it's, it's sitting on your soil. Within one day, it can reach from Lagos into Maiduguri or into Sokoto. So that's, that's, the, that's the difference. So in terms of security and in terms of value, Nigerians will benefit from it. But ultimately, the third level of benefit is that there will be dividend from this business. I know that we'll recover our cost. We'll make money from this, and those value will be returned back to Nigerians. Mr. Melikieri, we, we will hope that when the PIB is passed, as is already been considered in the National Assembly, we'll be able to have you back here uh, to you know, shed a little more light on this and a number of other issues concerning our petroleum sector. But thank you so much for coming and thank you so much. on Sunrise City this morning. Melikieri is a Group Managing Director of the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC, and is speaking to us here in our Abuja studio. Sadly, we won't be able to take your mails today, even though we have lots of them. Hopefully, we'll be able to do so tomorrow. Thank you for watching this morning. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. I'm Kaede Okikiolo. Have a wonderful day. I'm Ayo Makinde. I'm Chamberlain Osa. We'll see you next time.